<laughs> um, so again, thank you for joining on the uh, Acts of Connection Houseplants 101 session. This is the second session that we've done in this series. Um, so if you missed the first one, we've got that available as a video uh, that you can go back and watch. So please do if you're interested. We covered a lot of things around um, what are the basic requirements for, for indoor plants um, and how to address those requirements when picking a plant that's good for your space, whether it's at home or in the office. So um, I won't be covering over those things again today. Uh, I will refer you back to the earlier video um, if need be. But today I'm going to cover off a few topics. So I'm going to continue with some recommendations on um, house plants that I think work really well indoors. Um, and I'm also going to share with you some of my experiences with uh, when is good to repot your plant, how to look after your plants so that they live long and healthy lives. Um, I will, I think the best way for this to roll is for me just to go through and, and share what I'm going to share. If you have any questions, then feel free to um, either type them in. I've got Amelia who will be keeping an eye on the, the questions that come through on chat if they come through, or if you are happy to unmute yourself, then uh, please do so and we can have a little bit of chat about whatever your question is. Um, I don't know if I introduced myself, my name is Rhiannon Boyd in case I didn't, so I um, manage the Australasian Green Impact Program, so I support all of the uh, institutional leads that run Green Impact at your various universities. So um, we've got lots of people from different universities on the call today, so really excited to have so many of you on, um, on the session. So let's get talking about plants, unless I've got any questions right from the get-go. I think we're all good. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to first and foremost uh, go through a few of my um, recommendations for really good houseplants, ones that I didn't cover in the last video. Um, as you can probably see, I've got a, a fairly substantial indoor plant collection, um, which I haven't even touched the surface of in terms of sharing with you, um, but I've been recommending plants based on ones that I think are really easy for you to care for. Um, so we'll give a few more examples of those uh, this morning. Um, like I said, I did cover a lot of them in the last session, but uh, really easy ones to, to care for that don't require a lot of, um, you know, that aren't too fussy. Um, uh, the humble rubber plant, I didn't, I can't believe I didn't talk about this last week, but um, rubber plants are super, super easy. Um, to keep in the home. They will tolerate, if you're the type of person that doesn't really water your plants and forgets about them, I definitely fit in that category, by the way. I'm more likely to underwater a plant than overwater it. So I tend to favor those type of plants that are really tolerant um, of being underwatered or really tell you when they need watering. Um, so rubber, rubber plants come in a range of different varieties. The one I have here is a ruby rubber plant. So it actually gets these lovely um, pink uh, variegation around the outer side of the leaves. I find that the pink does fade off a little bit as the plant uh, and as the leaves age. Um, but these can get really big. They can be massive big statement plants in your house. They are a ficus variety um, and you can get beautiful deep um, uh, dark green leaves and Amelia is that you got one of them for your birthday isn't it I have to I don't have one <laughs> maybe you can show it um, Amelia had her birthday grab it. yeah gra grab your ficus and, and show everyone in case you haven't seen it um, so mine's got a bit of a, a split stem so it's coming up in two but they tend to just have like a single stem I think Amelia one if you can see her on the screen um, yeah, that they can get really big, they can tolerate low light, uh, they can tolerate not being watered very frequently. Um, so just, they definitely go on the list of really hard to kill um, and what I find to be quite beautiful plants. Um, so add that onto the list if you haven't thought about it. The other one I forgot to mention last time in terms of super easy, impossible to kill, at least in my experience, is the humble spider plant. Um, which is actually a bit of an old fashioned plant, I think. I remember having my grandma having one of these in her house in a big macrame um, hanging thing, and it was massive. Uh, and they've come back into fashion a little bit now. So uh, this is my spider plant. I haven't managed to kill it yet. Um, this one actually came from the Axe Conference a few years ago. If you've got any 
Axe people um, on the line today. We gave away plants at the Green Gown Award dinner a few years ago. This is my one. Um, Sue, I see you laughing. Have you kept, you didn't, yours didn't survive, did it? <laughs> um, I have not managed to kill this plant, even though about a month ago I dropped a massive big canvas frame on it and completely flattened it, like pancake flattened this plant. If you sort of look into the top, you can see she's, she's not looking great, um, but has really sprung back quite well. Um, we'll get very droopy and I notice the colour changes quite substantially on this leaves when, when the, ugh, on the leaves of this plant when it needs watering. They get really dull um, and quite droopy so you know that's time to give it a water. And I love these because when they're happy they start um, sending off these little babies and if you want you can propagate them and create new plants from your spider plant really quite easily. So. Nice one, they look great in hanging baskets too. I rent, so I don't have any in mine in a hanging basket, but I really want to uh, when I get into my own place. That'll be the first thing I do is put hanging baskets all over my house for plants like this. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about propagation, uh, how to propagate your plants in this session today. That's kind of deserving of its whole, of a whole um, webinar onto itself. So I'm thinking that might be the next one I look into is, um, how to propagate from your house plants. There's a lot of varieties that are really easy to do it. But in general, winter is not a really good time to be talking about um, propagating plants. So it's a, it's a good one to think about in spring when the war, warmer weather picks up. If you're in um, New Zealand or in the southern states of Australia, it's freezing at the moment and your plants don't really want to be thinking about um, being propagated right now. There are a couple of varieties of spider plants as well. If that one doesn't float your boat, let me just put you there. Uh, you can get this, I find a bit harder to find, um, but this is the curly leaf variety of spider plant. Um, so not quite as straight as the other ones, get these lovely curls. Finally starting to get babies out of this one. So it's a little bit happy. Um, but yeah, I've, I've not seen these around in nurseries quite as much as the regular variety. I don't know if that's just my local area, um, but I found it a bit harder to come across. Okay, so spider plant, rubber plant, super easy. Um, the other one, oh, of course, the um, Dracaena that I've got behind me, it's another, uh, another one that will tolerate most conditions indoors really easy to let go for a long time without watering. I've deliberately left this one. You can see that um, the leaves quite down here are really quite droopy. Um, this guy's well overdue for a water. So it'll, I'll be doing that first thing after the session today, but I just wanted to show you, um, you know, I think underwatering your plants is a better way to go. If you overwater, you kill your plants with kindness, you get all sorts of things like root rot, uh, um, or they're just generally unhappy sort of being soggy all the time. So better to get into the habit of letting your plants dry out and watching them um, or picking up their pot to sort of get an indication of what the moisture level is in, and going from there. So I've got another little guy. This is the same variety as the one behind me, but this one, um, they've got a bit of pink variegation coming through. So again, uh, this one's good. They look great groups together. I think they've got a bit of a um, sort of an arid, arid vibe to them. So any questions on um, those plants that I've just... Oh yeah, Andrea, propagating. If you want a plant to propagate, it's either the spider plant or um, the other. I've got a, another variety of plant that I'm going to show you as sort of my feature today, uh, which is the peperomia. Peperomia family um, and they're super easy to propagate as well and I'll like I said I'll do another session on all the different ways that you can do that shortly. Uh, so can you have a spider plant outside? It depends on where your outside is um, <laughs> really. Um, I know that they can do well in sort of undercover like um, what do you call them when you've got an outdoor or outside area if you've got a fresco or a, a uh, I've forgotten the word, it's gone straight out of my head. Balcony, because I've got a hanging basket under the balcony, so it's shaded, it's not in direct light. So would it be all right out there, do you reckon? Yeah, I think they'll be fine in any sort of undercover outdoor area, but you, I don't think you could just go stick it somewhere in full sun. It, would, um, okay. it wouldn't like that very much. Okay. Uh, and again, just keep an eye on it, and it will tell you when it wants water, which is always good. 
Um, okay, so the other plant variety I wanted to share with you today that um, is a really fun one, and I don't know, uh, I don't see these a lot around, but once I sort of picked up a couple, I absolutely fell in love with them. And these are my Pokemon. I'm trying, you know, I've got to get them all. Every time I see a Peperomia, I just have to buy it. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. They're really quite small and compact. So if you don't have a lot of space, um, then they're a good one to have. And you can pretty much, um, again, they fall in the category of really easy to care for. Most of them, that is. Some of them can be a bit more finicky than others. Uh, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, Peperomias look like this. So I've got quite a few different varieties that I'm going to show with you. But um, they are a tropical plant. They're actually an epiphyte. So in the, in the wild, they would grow sort of in trees and up in trees on rotting wood. Uh, and they're really quite small and compact. And they've got these beautiful sort of <laughs> fleshy leaves. <laughs> so somebody said, I kill them with ease. Is that the Peperomias? <laughs> um, that's okay. Hopefully I can give you some tips on how to keep your peps alive because um, I've not managed to kill a single peperomia yet um, and I'm not immune to killing plants. Um, I have a few examples that I'm going to show you of ones that have actually passed away in between um, the last session that we had just last month. Um, I had a spider mite outbreak so I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, Peperomias are pretty tolerant of most indoor conditions. They're quite happy to live in low light. Um, but again, there are a few varieties that might need a bit more light, just depending on um, the shape of or the type of leaves that they have. Uh, they, prefer, they prefer to be dried out um, before watering. So I, as I said, most of the plants um, that I keep indoors are quite tolerant of um, drying out quite a bit before you need to water. Um, the only one that I really do um, have to keep an eye on in terms of watering, but they're so dramatic that they tell you. I talked about these last session is the peace lily, and I've purposely kept this peace lily um, to show you just how unhappy this one looks at the moment. Very droopy. Um, you could keep this peace lily looking like this for weeks before actually watering it, and it would be okay. Um, they perk up really quickly, but this is my indicator plant. Um, you know, it's always a good idea to keep an eye on one of these to know how quickly um, your plants are drying out inside. Just let to show that one. <laughs> it's really unhappy at the moment. Uh, but back to peperomias. So um, what I love about these is, like I said, they come in so many different varieties. There's a lot of cultivars that are being released at the moment. Um, so they're popping up in, in nurseries, in your big box um, stores like Bunnings. Um, and I find them easy to keep alive if you don't kill them with love. So if you water these guys too much, they will rot. They've got really, um, really delicate root systems. So it's quite easy if you don't have them in a really free draining soil mix, or um, if you don't check them correctly when you bring them home, um, they may actually be grown in a plug, a plant plug. Has anybody heard of a plant plug before? Just looking in the scene. Nope. Okay, I'm about to blow your mind <laughs> because I guarantee you, if you've killed a peperomia, it's probably because it had a plug on it. So what plugs are, it's uh, a way that nurseries uh, use to propagate their young plants, either by seed or by cuttings. Um, and usually it's, a, it's supposed to be like a biodegradable mesh or something that they can wrap a really young plant around in um, and it's a, a little growing condition for a, a very young plant. Um, if your nursery is a good nursery that is growing your plants, they will use a genuinely um, biodegradable uh, product for a, a plant prop plug. Um, but what I'm finding more and more often is they're using sort of um, synthetic tapes and things like that that aren't breaking down. The idea around a, a plant plug is that the plant, as it grows and develops, will be able to push through it um, and expand its root system beyond that, that confined area and grow into a healthy, stable plant. But if a nursery is using sort of a cheaper or not a very good product for their plant plug, what happens is the roots get contained within a very small area um, and they don't have the strength to sort of break free um, of the plug itself. This can cause issues obviously because you're not getting a very healthy developing plant if it's only growing. Here, I've got an example. I pulled this out of my compost bin 
um, which just shows you that this particular plant plug was not in a uh, material that was breaking down anytime soon. So this is what a plant plug material looks like. You know, it's usually about an inch or a little bit bigger than an inch wrapped around the base of a plant. And as I said, they've got little holes in them. So if it's working the way it should be, the roots of the plant will break through those holes and the material will eventually decompose and you won't see it. What often happens is the plant struggles to get through this material. Um, so they've got really poor underdeveloped root systems and it comes a problem when you water. So if you imagine this plant was in a, um, just a regular nursery pot, had some around somewhere, there. Healthy plant, regular nursery pot, you can't see that there's a plant plug because they've covered it with soil up until this point, um, but you're doing all the usual things. You're checking to see if your soil is quite dry, it feels dry, so you water your plant. Um, what you don't realize that is the area right in that royal, uh, root zone that's contained within the tape or whatever material um, is usually saturated. So whilst the rest of the soil around the plant is dry and you're watering it because that's what you should be doing, you're oversaturating that root zone and you're getting root rot and the plant will die. Often I discover a plug, well I used to discover a plug before I knew about them, when you would just literally pull the plant off and it would break away from the root zone entirely. Um, so because pepperonias are quite delicate plants, they often do have these plugs in them. So it's something to be aware of. Um, when you bring a plant home for the first time, my recommendation is always that you don't immediately repot it. You need to give it some time to acclimatise to the environment in your home and, and that it's going to be living in. Um, but when it does come time to repot, and I'll talk about um, what things you should be looking out for when it, so you know when it's time to repot, always check for a plant plug. Um, if you do find one and you can see that there's no roots getting through the material, that it's not breaking down in any way, then I would very carefully remove that um, tape. It just feels like a, a tape to me. Um, remove it as best you can without damaging the roots uh, and then repot from there. And you should see an improvement, uh, a, a substantial improvement in your plant once you've removed that little plug there. Um, so yes, back to peperomias. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple other varieties while I've got them out. So in case you're wondering, this one here is the Emerald Ripple. So a lot of them have these ripple names because they've got these um, beautiful, juicy, um, ripply leaves on them. Not surprisingly, this one here is the Ruby Ripple. I've got a, a really highly variegated, if you're not good with peperomias, I'd actually avoid this one because I really struggle with this one. I find um, it's quite finicky, but this is the uh, pink lady um, variety because they, she gets these beautiful pink variegations coming through. You can sort of see it on the new leaves coming through there. Um, very finicky in terms compared to a lot of the other ones and I noticed lacks a higher humidity environment. Um, just the standard peps are, are good with um, the humidity in most homes. You don't need to have a humidifier or give them any special conditions. Um, but yeah, that one, not so much, stay away. <laughs> um, this is a little uh, piccolo, um, piccolo bandita or something like that, I think they call it. Um, showing you this one because some of the pepperoni varieties can get quite leggy. Um, so you can see this one's shooting up a really uh, tall strand. So if you don't like the look of that, uh, you can just cut it off and then you've got lots of different leaves to propagate from. As I said, this plant propagates super easily. You can propagate from the leaves, from the stems. The only thing you can't propagate from is the roots. Um, so I actually knocked one of these off when I was moving all of my plants out here. So I'm just going to keep hold of that because I'm going to um, propagate that one a little bit later. They... Some of the other varieties can get really tall and really leggy, um, so it, you do need to trim them if you like that compact look. Sometimes I like them to get tall, so this is another example of one that I've just let, um, let grow up to become taller than the other ones. Um, the stems are quite fleshy and not super strong, so I've actually had to stake this one a little bit just to give it um, some stability as it grows up. But again, if I had trimmed this one back, it would have been quite compact like the other varieties. I can never remember the name of this one. So it's like me metallic 
I always want to say Metallica. It's not Metallica, but it's something similar to that, in case you like that. Um, one of the newer cultivars on the market at the moment is the Peperomia Moonlight. So um, these ones actually get quite big. My one's a small one because I bought it as a little terrarium baby. Um, but you can get quite big, um, still very compact, compact um, plants when it comes to the peperomia. So absolutely love this one. Got silvery leaves where it gets the moonlight name from. Mine is actually flowering at the moment. So peperomias get these flowers that just kind of look like stalks popping out of them. Um, so you know you've got a happy pep when it's putting out these flowers. It can flower all the time. A lot of my flowers have just died off actually because um, I found running the heater quite a lot lately as we've been getting colder. Uh, most of my plants are drying out much quicker, so my watering schedule has been really bad. Um, and so I've got a lot of unhappy babies at the moment, but I'm hoping to get on top of that. Uh, last but not least, oh no, I've got more. So I tell you I like collecting peperomias? I've got quite a few of them. <laughs> Uh, this is another new variety that's sort of recently on the market, very similar to the Moonlight. This one's called Napoli Nights. Um, super compact, compact plant, so um, really gorgeous with the squishy, juicy leaves that they have. Another variety, which again is a little bit um, more rare. You don't see this one too often, and I forget, I forgot what this one, it starts with a T. Um, I can check up on all the names in case you like a plant that I've shown you and you really want to get it. This is an example of, it was flowering very recently, but has just died off. So I always go and pick those off as I see them. So I'm probably, you're probably sick of my peperomias by now, um, but I just wanted to show you in terms of if you like to collect um, and have a few different varieties, they're a really fun one. They come in all different um, you can see I sort of like the ripply leaves ones, but, but you can get them as, this is another form um, that you see quite a lot. I'm seeing these heaps in like Coles and Woolies, if you're in Australia at the moment. They sort of have these in the plant sections a lot at the moment. I haven't watered this plant in like two months, so really hardy, really good one. Just lives in my bathroom getting ignored. Uh, they have succulent varieties. Again, I buy a lot of my... Um, my plants as these terrarium babies because they're super cheap uh, and if you keep looking after them then you can get really uh, good plants without investing quite a lot of money. So these are sort of the succulent varieties of peperomia. They're not succulents but they just they have those really beautiful squishy leaves like a lot of the succulents do um, and they will get quite shriveled when you need to water them. So good, um, they will tell you again that they need water. But my favourite one that I've saved for last is my, one of my all time favourite plants. I love this guy so much, is my watermelon peperomia. So, um, pretty sure you can tell why it has the name watermelon peperomia. peperomia. Gets these massive big leaves. Mine's still quite small. The leaves will get bigger as the plant matures. Um, and just stunning. I think it's, if this plant doesn't make you happy, then I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what will. It makes me very happy. Um, and again, so, so easy to propagate. Um, I sometimes knock these leaves over. They, they are quite fragile. They're very squishy. Um, and you, you can break them or snap them off quite easily. But never fear. If you break off a peperomia leaf, you hold on to it. Um, and just stick it in some soil. So you can see I had half a broken leaf here. Um, pop that in some soil and now I have a brand new baby watermelon pep that, um, yeah, lots of those. Any questions around peperomias before I move on? And if anybody wants to um, have a comment, because I'm going to have a sip of my coffee <laughs> while, I, while I do so. Um, yeah, Rhiannon, when you um, propagate your peperonias, um, do you just use pot plant mixture? Um, yeah, like how do you do that? I'm actually going to talk about the soil medium I use next because it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's a, a, a lot of an area that people just think if you get some uh, a pot plant and you bring it home and you stick in some um, potting soil, that that's all that plant needs. But um, I've sort of learnt from a lot of trial and error and 
I make my own pot potting mix now based off a few different products. Um, so I'll move on to that now because it's a really good question. Um, I'll just move these peps out of the way so I don't end up with more broken leaves everywhere. Just quickly, Ree, there were two other questions about the peperom peperomia. How to spell it? <laughs> peperomia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what was the name of the one that was in Coles and Woolies, the smaller one? Oh, uh, this this is the one that I'm seeing a lot, a few different varieties of just popping up in like in the plant section in Coles and Woolies. I think they've realised there's a big market for it. I can't remember the name. I think it's a, a it starts with O. Um, again, I'll actually get a list of all the plants I've shown today and share it around because um, my memory is pretty good for plant names, but um, not infallible. So <laughs> uh, I'll double check on that one. And yeah, peperomia. Um, I think it's only one P. That's a really good question. Yes, one P for the person that asked how to spell peperomia. Was that everything on those? I think so. Um, okay, so soil mix. When you bring a plant home and it's time to repot, uh, and you're definitely sure you need to repot, the only reason why you need to repot a plant is really because um, it's become root bound. Uh, so its root system has outgrown the plant, or you might have noticed that there's a problem, um, a specific problem with your plant, and it, you might need to check on the roots and the soil and repot it. So Amelia's got a piece of leaf that just doesn't want to perk up no matter what she does. So um, I just recommended she actually repots that one. Um, again, in terms of time of the year, now is not a great time of the year um, to do repotting if you're in a cold climate area. Just like us, plants are sensitive to the cold, um, particularly their roots. So um, always better to think about repotting your plants on bulk, uh, in bulk sort of at the beginning of the growing season as we move into spring and summer. Um, but again, if you absolutely have to, um, if your plants are really root bound and not responding to anything else, you need to repot. Um, if you can, try and do it indoors or in a warm space. Uh, the last thing I'd recommend is going outside on a frigid cold day um, when there's lots of wind blowing and trying to repot your plants because you might actually send them into shock, transplant shock, um, and they, they won't respond very well. So signs that your plant is root bound. Um, it can be that you just need to constantly water it all the time. Um, the spider plant that I showed you just before is very root bound. I'll actually bring it over. Um, I need to constantly water this guy because basically what's happened is there's, there's very little soil left in the pot. I keep most of my plants in nursery pots um, just for ease of care, which means that the decorative pots can be just moved away. Um, and then you don't have to worry about holes with drainage if they don't have them. So I'm going to tip this guy. Another good sign that your plant is too big for its pot is that the roots are growing out of the drainage holes below. Um, so this guy is really root bound. It's very light. Um, so it feels like there's not much to this plant because basically there's very little soil. And I can tell when I water it, it doesn't retain a lot of that water because it stays light even after it's had um, a watering. So this is on my list of plants that I need to repot um, as soon as I can. I'll show you another one. I brought this one out for two reasons. Um, one, I've got roots sticking out of the bottom. So it's a good indication that this plant has outgrown its pot. And two, because this is a really common thing that we see in our plants is yellowing off leaves. Uh, and a lot of people get really worried when they see this. But as you can see from this plant, this is the oldest leaf on the plant. It's a very juvenile one. This is a, um, a monstera, a Thai constellation monstera. So this is one of the variegated varieties that's um, recently come onto the market as a tissue culture. Um, it's a very expensive plant, so I don't recommend getting this one unless you're um, quite happy to care for it because they're just, they were super rare. Um, the price has come down quite significantly for them recently though, which is good. Um, but yes, the yellowing leaves, these will, this will happen naturally on your plant. The older leaves will yellow off and die. They're not, um, they're not going to live forever leaves will eventually die. So if you're noticing that the oldest uh, and sort of the lowest leaves on your plant are dying off or turning yellow, totally fine. All I do is just break it off, pop it in the compost. 
problem solved. Um, where you need to be concerned in terms of yellowing leaves, if it's happening en masse across the whole plant, um, or if you're getting yellowing leaves that aren't, you know, based at the bottom or really old leaves. So I, this, uh, this is one of my old monsteras behind me, same sort of thing, which I've left it here specifically so I can show you. Old yellowing leaf, um, very juvenile because the monsteras, uh, the juvenile leaves don't have the fenestrations on them, so you know that they're old. Just take them off and pop them in the compost or pop them in your green bin or whatever you do with your green waste. Um, and you have a happy plant. Uh, so again, uh, coming back to the repotting, uh, roots coming out of the bottom, the plant feeling very light, or you're just noticing that you have to water it all the time, that's when you want to think about repotting. You don't need to just bring a plant home from the shop and repot it straight away for the sake of repotting it. Um, best to sort of leave them as long as you can in the nursery pots that they've come in. When you repot, you also only want to go up sort of the next size from the pot it's currently in. You don't want to put it in a really big, much bigger pot. Um, it might make the root system unstable. You might have issues with excess water retention because there's such a large amount of soil um, in that area. So usually just sort of going up to whatever the next size is, uh, is a good indicator for what you should be putting your, your plant into. Most people, oh, I knew I was going to struggle with this. Something like this. Premium potting mix for your plants, which is fine. Um, if you're going to just use one day to potting mix, get something like this. Try and get something that's got um, all these ticks on it because that's a, a good standard that it's a good quality um, potting mix for you to use. Obviously, just sort of a general, you can get all sorts of specific types that have been adapted to whether they're succulents or um, vegetables or herbs or anything like that. But just a standard potting mix is um, okay to use. My general problem that I have with this, these types of mixes is I find there's a lot of just rubbish in them. I don't know if you have ever really looked at the soil that comes in these, but I don't find it's a very quality, high quality mix. Um, when you put water through it, it just very quickly sort of turns into sludge. Um, and the other issue is I find with this, the, the makeup is there's very little aeration in um, these sort of packaged potting mixes. They tend to compact really quickly. So if you plant uh, a pot plant in this and then you water it a few times, you'll find that that um, soil is really compact. Um, it's quite hard to just sort of stick your finger in there and, and feel whether there's much moisture if it's dried out. Um, and that's doing the same thing to your roots. It's compacting the soil around the root system. Uh, and most plants really do love um, air and water moving around the roots. So um, I've actually made my own mix of um, soil medium. So what I use is, uh, I do use a proportion of just a standard potting mix, or if you're lucky enough to have a good compost at home, um, you can use your own compost. And I just mix in a few other ingredients to increase the quality uh, and to help with aeration, because aeration I think is a good one. Um, to really help your plant thrive. Most of the varieties that I'm showing you here, actually all of them so far, um, love a really well aerated, free draining soil mix. So when you make some adaptations to it, it means that the water will move through quickly um, and saturate the root system, but it won't stay there waterlogged, causing uh, root rot or other problems um, with water retention. So the number one thing, if you're just going to add one thing to your um, standard potting mix, I would recommend you grab yourself a bag of perlite. Has anybody seen perlite before? No. You might have seen this. Some nursery pots will come, if you're getting plants from a really quality nursery, they should have perlite in their soil mix. Um, it's an inorganic material. Um, it's actually made from volcanic rock or um, just looks like white, basically looks like polystyrene. Um, and I have seen some bad nurseries that will actually use polystyrene, crumbed up polystyrene in their soil mix as an alternative to this, um, which really isn't good because then you end up with little fragments of polystyrene um, in your plants and in your compost and it's just 
it's non-recyclable, it's not non-organic, it's not going to break down, so it's not good. Um, but some nurseries will use it as a cheap alternative to perlite. But perlite itself is basically, oh, here's my camera, it will just crush into dust, um, very lightweight, um, inorganic, so it won't uh, affect your soil in any way. And it's just a good way to um, get some aeration and drainage through your soil mix. Um, Here's an example I can show you, if I can just lift up. This is one of my pepperonias, probably not a good thing. You can see the little white um, bits through there, which is just perlite through the soil mix. So if you're just gonna add one thing, um, that's my number one recommendation. I add about four or five things to my soil mix. So I tend to do a scoop of regular soil mix to a scoop of um, perlite. I also add in, you can get this again, just from your nursery, uh, big box store like Bunnings, um, orchid mix or orchid bark. I actually found this last night when I went to Bunnings, uh, which is a coarse orchid bark. I've been searching for this for about six, six months and haven't been able to find it. Uh, it's just a much more chunkier mix than your standard soil. So um, orchids really, you know, they're another epiphyte. Um, they don't like a lot of um, compaction around the soil, so like really chunky soils. This has got big bits of bark in it. Um, so I put a, uh, you know, a good scoop of this into my mix as well. Again, it just helps adding um, that aeration and drainage to your soil. Uh, and most orchid mix should be um, pretty neutral. It shouldn't be adding anything too crazy to your soil mix as well. So that's a good one. Uh, again, optional, you don't have to have it, but I like to have that. Um, the other thing I put in is to help with water uh, retention, but not in a way that's going to um, cause root rot in your plants. So uh, it used to be really popular to use peat moss as um, for, for this purpose in soil. So peat moss is, uh, comes from sphagnum moss which grows in bogs in places like Canada, and you've probably heard of peat bogs. It's a, a source of um, fuel for a lot of people, and it's where uh, a lot of the commercial um, peat moss that's available is actually taken from. So there is some questionable, I don't, I don't like using it because I don't think I should be taking peat moss from um, farms in Canada uh, to put in my pot plants over here. What I do use is um, cocoa qua, 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 I don't know how to say that. C-O-I-R. It's one of those words that you never say out loud until you have to. Um, basically, this is just uh, a, a, a material that they take out of um, coconut production. Um, you buy it in a brick that looks like this. I just bought a little brick to show you. So this one, this brick will make nine litres of, um, of this when you break it up and add water to it. And you can get them in... in bigger bricks that will make up to 90 litres of this. So a little bit goes a long way. Uh, and I'm going to show you what it does in terms of water retention. So I've just got a cup of this coconut. Qua, qua. I'm really struggling with that today. I'm sure I'm getting a few people laughing at me as I say it wrong. If anybody wants to correct me, feel free. Um, so you just break it up from the brick. I do this step first when I'm making up my soil mix. So I put this in my container first. I break it up. And then you want to wet it. This can have a slightly acidic pH, um, so it's not a bad idea if you do want to uh, rinse it. Uh, most coconut trees are sort of grown in um, tropical, uh, near, near salt water beaches and things like that, so it can have a bit of a high, uh, high salt content. Um, but I use so little of it and I wet it down straight away, I've never found it to be an issue with my plants. There you go, there's, uh, there's about a cup there and I'm gonna show you how much. So I poured quite a bit of water in there and I'm going to give that a bit of a mix around and you'll be able to see in no time at all, if I let this soak, it would work better, but straight away, all that water has been soaked up into that coconut. So this is a really good, um, really great for keeping moisture in your soil, but not in a way that's going to make your plants rot. So again, sort of about equal parts of coconut to potting mix to uh, orchid bark uh, and perlite is what I put uh, in my mix. And then the final thing I add in, again, completely optional, uh, my bag. 
And this is the smallest quantity that I'll add when I'm mixing up my own soil base is horticultural charcoal. If anybody's done anybody work, any work in terrariums, um, you will have seen that there's always a charcoal layer in your terrarium because this just helps sort of um, cleansing. It has the um, charcoal sort of absorbs any nasties in your soil. It can help keep um, any sort of bacteria or, or any disease from growing in your soil. So just a handful of this, uh, the smallest ratio um, compared to any of the other materials is what I put in. Um, and it's quite chunky as well. Um, so again, it just helps with the, there's some pieces there, um, helps with adding extra aeration um, and drainage to your soil as well. So that's a really good one if you want to um, get into it. Uh, like I said, I'm very invested in my plants and I have a lot of plants. So for me to invest in all of these different um, products to make a soil mix that is um, really good, I'm quite happy to do that. But again, if you don't want to do that, I just recommend adding perlite um, as a first step and you can sort of make a choice on what you want to add. How I do that, I just put scoops, as I said, in a container and then I just give it all a mix up. Here's one I prepared earlier this morning because I was not going to try and do this on camera in my lounge room. Um, and what I end up with looks a little bit like that. So this is what I put pretty much all of my plants in and I haven't had any issues with it. Um, the only thing I would say is that some of the um, aroids that I have, so aroids are like your monsteras, uh, your philodendrons, um, no philodendrons here today, sorry, um, or anthuriums, really tropical plants, uh, really love a chunky mix, like your orchids as well. So I'd put more of that orchid bark in if I was repotting up one of those plants because they, they seriously love it to be super free draining. So that's my soil mix. Anybody have any questions on that component while I prepare some space? No? Um, yeah, I was going to ask a question, Ray. You say um, if you're just going to put one thing in, put the perlite in, but if you were to put, say, two in, what would be the next obvious one? Um, again, it really depends on the plant. If I was planting up a monstera or a, um, a philodendron or something, I think the perlite, uh, not the perlite, sorry, um, the orchid one is really good because it just gives it a nice chunky mix. Um, so that would be my second, depending on the plant. Um, but otherwise, I think the coconut is really good just for the water retention properties. And I prefer to use a product like that because, you know, it's a natural product. It's a byproduct of, um, you know, um, something that's already been uh, produced. So I think it's much more sustainable than peat moss or anything else like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bit, I can't really answer that. It really depends on the plant. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, how are we going on time? When it comes to potting, I just wanted to talk a, a couple of uh, tips around actually potting the plant. Um, in the last session I ran, I talked about ordering plants online as an alternative, which became a really big thing for a lot of people uh, in the midst of lockdown. Um, and it's a really dangerous thing for people like me that obviously have way too many plants. Um, so I have a couple of plants that I recently bought online that I have specifically kept to show you um, what to do in this instance and how to pot it up. Uh, what I've noticed though is a lot of the nurseries that do ship plants um, have started shipping them in, uh, in little pots, which is absolutely fantastic because it means all you do when you get home is um, just keep an eye on them and make sure that they haven't been disturbed too much in transit. But it can also be really common to send plants bare rooted if you order them online, which basically just means the plant's been taken out of the pot it was growing in, the root ball's been wrapped up in like um, maybe sphagnum moss or in, in paper towel or something and sort of shipped that way to reduce um, the cost of shipping. So I've got two plants here that I've been a very bad plant mum because I got them about a month ago and they've been sitting here like this for about a month. A month. I've been keeping an eye on them to make sure that they haven't died. So let's just see <laughs> how they go. Um, I bought these from Green Beans, which is a Sydney-based nursery. They're the first ones that I've ever had that have sent something, um, sent in bubble wrap plastic, which is not ideal. 
Um, a lot of the nurseries I order from online, they send things in paper or compostable plastic, which is obviously much more sustainable. So sorry, this one came in bubble wrap. Um, I didn't really think about unwrapping this on camera, so I hope that noise doesn't sound horrible to you. Anyone want to guess what this plant is? It's a cactus, isn't it? No. Oh. It's a peperomia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, should have guessed. <laughs> um, so this is actually a mini watermelon pep. So very similar to the, the large pep I showed you, but it's a mini variety um, that I've been wanting to get my hands on for quite a while. So this is just a little baby. Um, so there's another layer and it's full of plastic, which is really annoying um, to try and get. But it does mean that this is why they've been able to survive so long wrapped up. Um, for a month without any attention because the water retention has been really good. Let me just see if I can get him out. Now this guy has been completely planted in peat moss, which is why I think it has, it's very wet, like it's been sitting here wrapped in that plastic for over a month and it's absolutely saturated. So I think this guy's probably actually going to have a little bit of root rot. So you can see in there, it's just completely um, like moisture overkill. So I was going to repot this one, but I think now that I've seen it, I'm actually just going to let it dry out for a little bit and see what happens now that I've taken all that plastic off. And uh, I'll give you an update on that one. We'll see how he goes. But in terms of the size of the plant, this one I, it doesn't really need to be repotted. This is a perfect size pot um, for a juvenile plant like this. So. Um, there's a little unboxing for you. That <laughs> I have another one, which I suspect this one was sent fair rooted, but again, um, I haven't unwrapped it to look. Anyone want to guess what this one? It's a completely different variety to any that I've shown you today, but it did feature quite a lot in our last video. Uh, just looking at the question, uh, recommend some nurseries we can order online from. Um, I can, from um, Australia, we've got quarantine restrictions, so I can only recommend ones that I've dealt with, which are ones that either ship to Victoria or the Eastern States. We can't get plants from Northern Territory or Western Australia because of the um, uh, biosecurity restrictions. Um, but some of my favourite is uh, one called Verdant Dwellings. Absolutely fantastic. They're based in Dramana on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria and they're just, their plants are fantastic. Their shipping is fantastic. They're just really great. Uh, another one is Uprooted, another Melbourne-based one. Again, um, just a small business um, that has started selling plants out of their backyard and they do a really great job. So any, anybody have any idea what this is as I unwrap it? I can see most of it now. It's not one I've ever seen sold in a shop, which is why I bought it. <laughs> so this is a, a pothos, very, very similar, so a cousin to or another cultivar of just the standard devil's ivy that we see growing all over the place. Um, usually you see these as um, like the standard uh, devil's ivy. You can get marble queen, you can get snow queen, which are a white variegated variety. Uh, you can get neon pothos, which are really, uh, uh, really fluoro sort of yellowy green. I showed them in the last video, but I'd never seen this one before. This is a Marble Queen crystal variety. Um, and that crystal comes from just, there's so much white variegation on this plant. You can see there's very little green coming through. Um, so even though the pothos are just a, a, you know, super easy, impossible to kill plant in terms of indoor plants, um, this one's going to need a lot more light requirements. Uh, because it's so highly variegated with the white, that means it doesn't have a lot of green pigment in it. Uh, and the green pigment is chlorophyll, which is what the plant uses to make energy from the sun. Um, so the less pigment a plant has, sort of the more uh, light requirement it's going to need. That's why really dark plants, like the dark uh, rubber plants, um, are really good if you've got a super dark corner in your house that you want to put a plant in, like those um, rubber plants are a really good one. So this one has been sent bare rooted. I was correct, which was good. So when a, a plant, oh, it's been sent in a plug, even better. <laughs> so I'm making a mess here. This is actually two separate plants that have been shipped to me in plugs. 
So you can see from the, um, these ones, the roots have only come through the bottom of the plug. None of them have managed to push through the porous sides of this tape here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna very carefully off camera because it's gonna take me a bit longer uh, to do is peel this plug material off and I'm gonna pop it into, uh, luckily I've got, I keep all of my nursery pots when I repot, I keep these, I don't throw them out. So I've got a nice little stash of them that I can use to either um, pot plants that I buy online or you know size up my plants as I go. Um, so never throw them out, keep them if you've got the space, but if you do wanna throw them out, they can go in your recycling bin. But as soon as I get this guy unwrapped from his plug, I will place it in this, this is probably a little bit too big, but it'll, do if I don't have a small one. There's a small one. There we go. That's about a perfect size for a plant this size. I'm going to fill it up with soil. And what I'm not going to do when I uh, plant him in is shove that soil in and compact it in as tight as I can and make it as snug as a bug. All you're doing is really compacting the, the soil material around the root system. And what do we know? We know that plants really like aeration and free drawing, uh, free draining soil. So once I've got enough um, soil in there, what you can do is just tap it, tap it on a table or a surface, um, and that will settle the material down without compacting the root. So if the soil level goes down, you need to put a bit more in, do that, tap it, tap it, tap it until you're happy, you're not getting a lot more movement around that soil, and then the final thing you do is give it a watering to water everything in, and you should have a very happy plant. Um, so that's what I'll, I'll finish that one off once we've finished the session today. So what have I covered? I've covered potting mediums, I've covered peperomias, covered some signs of um, yellowing leaves being okay. What else did I want to talk about? I wanted to quickly talk about spider mites because I've had an issue with them. I did mention them in our last video. Uh, they're a really common plant pest that you can bring home with you. So when you're picking out new plants, or even if you receive them um, online, uh, I, I got my mealybug infestation from an online plant recently. Um, spider mites come on um, certain types of plants. So they, they don't like peace lilies, you'll never find spider mites on peace lilies, um, but they can be on pretty much anything. And they just look like really fine spider webs. And if you look really closely, you can see tiny little dots moving across them really bad. They can kill a plant almost overnight, which is, this was my Mickey Mouse tarot, which was a beautiful plant that had Mickey Mouse shaped leaves. Um, I noticed one night that the leaves had just started to turn yellow over the whole plant. And then I picked it up and looked closely. Sure enough, it was covered in spider mites. Um, I, treated, I treated it with neem oil and I washed down the plants. Uh, and I gave it a good watering with some sea salt, which is a root tonic. And as you can see, I was too late. The spider mites did their job. So keep an eye out. They can do a lot of damage and they can really spread quickly through your plant collection. So if you do notice them, quarantine your plant, move it away from all the rest as quickly as you can and do check over your plants to see if they have spider mites. Succulents aren't immune to spider mites, as I learned, because this is my beautiful Buddha's temple that was also victim to the same spider mite attack. So I was devastated to lose this guy. Um, and yeah, same thing. I just noticed a little webbing on it. I tried to treat it, but it was already too late. I think that was everything I wanted to talk about today. Um, any questions, uh, any, oh my God, I didn't show my other one. I keep forgetting to show this. This is not a peperomia, but it's another plant that's become very um, popular in recent times, and it was almost impossible to find, but another goodie is the Chinese money plant as it goes by. That's its um, common name, and it's got these beautiful coin-shaped leaves. Uh, so just a really unusual plant. I love this plant. Mine's very happy. It's got all these babies coming through that, again, I'm going to have to propagate, but I'm saving them for a propagation video. Um, another recommendation for a plant that you can keep uh, at home and is very easy. You just have to make sure you turn it regularly because it's quite spindly and they will snap off if they grow too much in one direction. Um, okay, so we've got a few minutes left. If anybody wants to throw some questions my way, feel free to. Or if you want to share any of your plant babies or um, got any tips for me, now's the time. Otherwise, I hope you've enjoyed it and learned something.
Is there something you can do to prevent spider mites or is it just something that unfortunately they just find their way? Pests. Yeah, um, checking for them before you bring anything new into your home is the best way. Um, quarantining your plant. So if you buy a new plant, um, putting it in an area away from all the others so that you can keep an eye on it. I've lost more plants to spider mites than anything else. Um, and you, you just don't notice it and then you bring it home and then overnight they can just be like gone. Um, almost always spider mites in my case. So yeah, just, just looking for it is the best that you can do. Um, Re, I have my plant here just because I'm a bit confused. I feel like I have a bit of spider mite in it. It's got like, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I don't know if you can see that. Can you see like this moldy, it's it like mold or I don't know if it's spider mites. It's um, probably mold because it's really common um, for soil, particularly if you're just using standard soil to, to grow mold on the surface, um, particularly at this time of year. If it is mold, don't worry about it. I just mix mix it in a little bit. It's totally fine. It's because you know um, soil is an organic material. It's full of all sorts of different um, organics. In fact, when you're using potted potting mix from a bag, you should follow the directions on them. You are supposed to actually use gloves and a face mask when using potting mix because it does have all of those. Um, it can have some nasties in it, or if you wet it down before you use it. Um, another reason why I tend to prefer to use the materials that I do than just a, a big bag of potting mix. Um, but yeah, mold mold happens. Sometimes you can even get little fungi growing out if the soil is too moist. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Spiders literally look like webs with tiny little specks in them. So you can pick them quite easily. So with the mold, I just like mush it around and add some more potting mixture? I mean, I just leave mine. It doesn't particularly worry me. What you can do sometimes, if you've got the uh, orchid bark or a really chunky mix, putting a layer on that on top of the soil can help because the water will drain through that really quickly. That will help with mold growing or even if fungus gnats, if you've got fungus gnats as a problem, they can grow in your soil. They're the tiny little bat black bugs that fly around and if you've ever had a meeting with me, you've probably seen me doing this um, every now and then because I do get fungus gnats. So if you can keep that top couple of centimetres of your soil dry, it will help with those as well. Okay, great, thanks. No problem. Uh, just checking the chat for any, don't think I've got any questions coming through on the chat. So if anybody else, I wanted to ask, now's the time. Otherwise, we'll wrap up for today. And thank you very much for joining uh, for this session. I'll do another one. If you, if you still want to learn more, I've got more to share. So I'm happy to keep going with this. Um, but next month for Acts of Connection, we move into Plastic Free July. So our whole um, monthly series will be focused on um, starting to uh, avoid plastics in our everyday lifestyle. We'll have DIY demonstrations and we'll have some guest presentations on the plastic problem. Um, so we've got those coming up as well. Yay, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ree. Thanks, Ree. Yeah, thanks, I, feel, I feel really bad. I've repotted every plant I've ever bought, but I'll stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do the same thing. I would bring them home and be like, oh, baby, you need to be repotted. You need everything <laughs> and fantastic. And yeah, often the best thing is to just leave them for a while. Yeah, I promise. From now on, I will. <laughs> That's my one takeaway. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> Actually, every session, I bring my, my succulents and my cactus out and I never get the chance to talk to them. So I'll have to do another session on those as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. A succulent session. Yep. Yep. All right. Yep. Oh, Not voting that. <laughs> great. Thank okay. Well, thanks. I'm going to help. Happy planting. And uh, I'll see you all next time.